Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week during National Rice Month, a visit with last year's Mississippi Farmer of the Year, an expert in rice. In Southern Gardening, we're in Hattiesburg for a little DIY in pond gardening. In the markets, drought and heat affecting the cattle business around the country and here in Mississippi. And before we meet this year's Tree Farmer of the Year, a lesson in tree farm economics. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. As always, good to have you with us here on Farm Week. This week, a different kind of show instead of our normal news block and in celebration of National Rice Month, an encore visit with Mike Wagner, Mississippi's Farmer of the Year in 2022. He's a rice expert and does things differently. Travel with us to Sumner, Mississippi and Two Brooks Farm. Mike Wagner's Two Brooks Farm is a rice and soybean plantation in Sumner, Mississippi, in the state's North Delta area. His property is a contiguous tract of land 3,100 acres large, two-thirds of it in Tallahatchie County, the rest in LaFleur County. Wagner grows about 2,000 acres of rice a year, another 1,000 acres of non-GMO soybeans. The soybeans, he says, bring a premium on the market, and he mills about a third of the rice he grows. The rest goes to markets in Latin America or the high-end packaged rice industry in the U.S. All that said, what sets Two Brooks apart is Wagner's commitment to conservation, fitting his farm into the ecosystem, and using an ag approach he learned early in his career called LISA, Low Input Sustainable Agriculture. His view is that conservation and profitability don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive concepts. With two lakes on his land and a system of ditches he's turned into canals, he focuses on conserving as much water as possible, even in a water-rich state like Mississippi. We capture 95% of the water that is emitted from our fields. We capture it and recycle it on the farm. We use that water for, uh, in, in the summer for our crops. In the winter, we use it to attract waterfowl. Wagner says that Lisa concept, low input sustainable agriculture, allows him to leverage his resources toward a lot of different needs on the farm. Over the years, it has allowed him to self-finance, stretching resources and making improvements that generate more revenue rather than simply renting or buying more land. It allowed me to think about inputs that I use. Do I really need these inputs? I don't need a perfectly clean field to generate an income for uh, my family and the, the employees on the farm, for the tax assessor. Uh, a few weeds won't hurt, a few bugs don't hurt. Everything Wagner says is integrated, from water to woods to wildlife. That realization years ago prompted him to be more innovative with his methods. Now he simply finds success in striking a balance between creating productive land that exists within the ecology and the natural elements that coexist within it. In other words, he's learned to be extremely observant, sometimes learning by accident. I uh, would watch the rice fall over because the soil was too rich. The soil was too rich because I was putting out too many synthetic fertilizers. Uh, we already had, we had half of our fertilizer from the waterfowl. Our yields were, were maintained. Our, they're as fine as our fields that are more intensely managed. In fact, some of them uh, a great deal better. And it's because I think because there's a natural ecology going on out in the field. As for balancing profitability with conservation. They walk hand in hand. I love technology as much as the next guy. I appreciate a, a safer way to clean my crop or a more fuel efficient tractor or combine. That said, Maslow said, uh, if only you have a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. I want a lot of tools in my chest. Uh, I want natural tools, I want man-made tools, I want to use my intellect and uh, observations to cobble together the least expensive approach to generate the most calories per acre in the most sanitized way I possible. That's my focus on this plantation. 
And then there's the concept of quality. According to the county agents with whom he works, Wagner emphasizes quality over quantity if a choice has to be made. Years ago, the United States grew the finest rices in the world. We had uh, maybe five or six varieties. They were very clear, low chalk, higher yielding. And I noticed that the Latins loved our rices, uh, but they had moved to maybe some South American growths because of uh, quality issues. There are several universities in the United States that breed some high quality rices, and I've stuck with those over the years and generally generate a, 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 a premium over what many of our neighbors do. A lot of our rices end up in Latin America to very discerning buyers or uh, to the U.S. package industry for, for what looks nicer on a grocery store shelf than some of the lesser quality varieties. Bottom line, Wagner takes a unique approach to farming. He's well known for his innovation and his conservation. At the end of the day, he says he focuses on being a complete package and on producing food that can feed millions of people. It's calories per acre. That's how I think. I want to generate calories per acre, wholesome calories per acre, and still do my job for the environment. Thanks to Mike, who was very generous with his time. He was selected as the Mississippi winner in last year's Sunbelt Ag Expo Farmer of the Year competition. If you'd like to know even more, visit his website at twobrooksfarm.com. This week in our Southern Gardening segment, something else a little different, landscaping with a little pond action. Our Eddie Smith traveled to Southern Mississippi for this story. Careful, you might just think you're in paradise. Today, Southern Gardening is at Hennington House in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, admiring a beautiful backyard garden pond. The use of plants in and around the pond creates a beautiful space to relax and unwind. The first thing you notice is the water feature, which produces the gentle sound of trickling water and the serene sight of ripples dancing across the surface. I love the horsetail plants. Horsetail is a rush-like evergreen perennial, which grows up to five feet tall. The rough, hollow, vertically ridged, segmented, bamboo-like dark green stems rise up from the plant rhizomes. Each stem node is marked by a whirl of tiny, stem-clasping, scale-like leaves, which are fused into an ash-gray sheath, ending in a fringe of teeth. Split-leaf philodendron, a large, non-climbing, semi-woody shrub with huge, glossy, wavy margin, deeply dissected evergreen leaves adds a tropical feel to this garden pond. Being cold hardy in USDA Zone 9 through 11, this plant will usually only survive outside in South Mississippi. Variegated Swedish ivy brightens up the garden pond area with its spreading and trailing habit of growth and attractive small round leaves with distinctive creamy white edges. Guacamole Swedish Ivy also enhances the garden pond area with its deeply textured and variegated leaves with bright chartreuse and splashes of avocado green. Other plants add to the beauty and charm of this backyard pond. Let's not forget the goldfish darting around. It's like they have their own little underwater world. Consider adding a garden pond to your backyard. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up with one of my favorite Farm Week stories, Tree Farm Economics. We head to the town, the peaceful town of Aberdeen, Mississippi. There we meet Mr. Bobby Watkins, whose tall pines planted more than 30 years ago are both his retirement income and his legacy. Mr. Watkins was born to be a tree farmer. His love of the land sustains the here and now and will cradle generations to come. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. 
I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report, prices trending up. That's absolutely right, and that's not unexpected. They have been trending down for the past few weeks. We'll get into the reasons why and more. But first, the numbers. We'll take a look at last week's biggest gains and losses. And then this month's WASD report. What did it say? And finally, a dive into the cattle situation here in Mississippi. So, markets closed last week, mostly up. This includes both livestock and row crops. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, sugar, up nearly a cent, a near three and a quarter percent increase from the previous week. Last week's biggest loss, soybeans, down 22 and three quarters cents, a near one and three quarters percent decrease from the previous week. So this month's WASD report dropped last week. Biggest takeaways I've seen have to do with production and supplies trending downward all across the board. Doesn't mean we're in a shortage, but I still found it interesting. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat use and supply outlook unchanged from last month. Projected season average farm price, $7.50 per bushel. Global wheat supply is down 7.2 million tons. Production lowered for Australia, Canada, Argentina, and the EU. Consumption unchanged. Ending stocks down 7 million tons. U.S. corn beginning stocks, 5 million bushels lower. Production up 15.1 billion bushels. Ending stocks up 19 million bushels. Season average farm price, $4.90 per bushel. Global corn production mostly unchanged, ending stocks up 2.9 million tons. U.S. rice supplies up, production forecast up 17.3 million hundredweight, average yield up 52 pounds. Exports projected 85 million hundredweight higher. Season average farm price $16.80 per hundredweight. Global rice supplies down 4.4 million tons. Consumption down 0.2 million tons. Trade also down 0.8 million tons. Ending stocks down 4.2 million tons. U.S. soybean production down 59 million bushels, yield down 0.8 bushels from last month, crush down 10 million bushels, and exports also down 25 million bushels. Season average farm price, $12.90 per bushel. Global soybean crush down 1.8 million tons, exports also down 0.4 million tons, ending stocks down 0.2 million tons. U.S. red meat and poultry production down, egg production also down. U.S. milk production also down as well. Cheese, butter, and whey price forecast raised. Non-fat dry milk prices forecast lower. U.S. cotton beginning stocks up 550,000 bales. Production lowered 860,000 bales. Consumption unchanged, but exports down 200,000 bales. Season average farm price 80 cents per pound. Global cotton production 1.7 million bales lower. Trade 600,000 bales lower. And ending stocks 1.6 million bales lower. Now we take a look at the cattle situation here in Mississippi. A bit of a microcosm of what's happening all over the U.S. Ongoing drought nationally, making it difficult for ranchers to keep their herds. Not enough hay. I spoke with Mississippi rancher Ted Parker and Mississippi State Extension Professor Rocky Lemus to get the details. 
pay prices are extremely high because there's a lack of pay in South Mississippi because of the drought and also to make it worse, we're hauling a lot of hay to the west, to South Texas and all where they're in the middle of a big drought as well. There's just a huge shortage of hay this year. Hay prices are plenty high, so people are just selling out because they've got just a good time to get out, I guess. Got a good reason to get out. Don't not gonna have the feed carry them through the winter. And don't want to spend a lot of money to buy the feed to carry them through the winter. And, and the hay is just absolutely not there. You know, they'll buy back next spring or summer, buy some back. But a lot of the guys that are selling out will never that land will never have cattle again. Just my belief. Hay mentories are probably, I'll say, forty uh, percent this year compared to other years, uh, mainly because the drought is is being largely largely affected South Mississippi. Uh, anything from South I twenty, I've been in severe droughts for most of the summer, so uh, hay production have really declined to maybe one cut of hay instead of three or four cut of hay. So that's going to have a huge impact on our cattle production, one, because producers are going to have to try to find hay in large quantities to, uh, to maintain those animals. And another thing is that because we're still in a drought situation, that's also impacting early planting of annual ryegrass in most of the southern U.S., especially South Mississippi, where our stock of cattle operations are uh, the largest, but with this drought that we see in Mississippi happening in this this uh, this summer, actually have made some farmers rethink about their business. And with the cattle prices being the the way they are right now, they're taking advantage to make sure that they liquidate the herd easier than waiting later on. Uh, I think this going to have huge impact on the industry for next year, as we look at cattle inventories and the need of beef production that we're going to we're going to need for to maintain uh, the consumers. I think we're going to see those prices of beef going up a little bit higher next year than we will have in past years. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. According to the WASDE report, looks like commodities mostly down across the board. Time will tell us what that looks like. Mike? Thank you, Zach. Back in 2018, the Wall Street Journal published an article entitled Thousands of Southerners planted trees for retirement. It didn't work. Its basic premise reverberated throughout the Southeast, where there are a lot of tree farmers. But as you might suspect, there's actually more to the story. Forestry is Mississippi's number three ag commodity. We looked deeper into the idea of growing trees for retirement. As it turns out, we didn't have very far to look. I just always have loved land and being outside and camping out and Boy Scouts and different things. And uh, we've got a real pretty lake we sit at by every afternoon and uh, just enjoy being outside, listening to birds and looking at the clouds. Bobby Watkins was born to be a tree farmer. These pines planted 30 years ago just outside the peaceful town of Aberdeen, Mississippi, are both his retirement income and his legacy. Today, under his watchful eye, Bobby's friend and trusted logger Rodney Johnson is doing the final harvest on land bought long ago by Bobby's grandfather after World War I. The pines, he says, are in his blood. I started coming up here in the, in the 50s, actually, with my grandfather, and most of this land was in uh, row crops, uh, soybeans, corn, grain sorghum. That really wasn't the best use for the land, and so the best use is, is trees. And so we started planting pine trees in these old soybean and cotton fields uh, in the late 80s. Back in the day, Bobby got degrees from Mississippi State in animal science, agronomy, and entomology. For the next 30 years, he worked in corporate America in the research end of agricultural chemicals. All of that was excellent preparation for someone interested in forestry, which he's been doing exclusively for the last decade and a half. 
It also helped him develop a long-term plan. We have a management plan, so everything's written down. Of course, the plan can change and you can modify it, but if you have a, a road map, a, like a flight plan, a plan to follow for 30 years to 50 years, you can follow that plan. It makes it a lot easier on everybody, especially your extended family and friends that you can share it with. Rodney, y'all will be through in another couple of weeks. Yeah. And then w what do you think I'm going to have to spend or do to get ready to site prep? and a plant. Yeah. Rodney well, Johnson has known this, Bobby this for 20 years. Here, a veteran logger and logger of the year himself in 2017, Johnson has done two thinnings on Bobby's land and now the final harvest in a 30-year rotation. The two of them have looked far ahead over the years to maximize the tree harvest in every way. And by the way, if you're a landowner and want Rodney to cut for you, you'll need to make an appointment at least two years out. His company is that much in demand. Bobby loves the land. He loves the trees and he's proud of what he's done. He's worked really hard over the years to do it. Um, and Bobby studies and uh, he, he makes informed decisions. And Bobby's not looking for tomorrow, but he's looking for the future. Needless to say, that kind of effort and foresight in their partnership has also maximized the money both of them have made over that time. I've come over here on quite a few times and we walked through the property and looked at it and, and looking down the road we'll say, you know, in five years we need to do this. And you know, I've always said no plan is a plan to fail. I didn't make that up. Somebody else said it a long time ago. But in the timber industry and if you're farming trees, you don't get to uh, do the harvest that often. So you need to plan for the future. Another partner essential to the success of a tree farmer is a forester. Davis Lovelace is a veteran. He has a degree in forestry and wildlife management and worked for the Mississippi Forestry Commission for a time. His advice is priceless. Well, the first thing that I would ask a landowner is, what's your goals? What do you want to do? What do you want out of this property? For most people, it's a legacy. You know, what am I, what am I going to leave to my children? To others, it's an investment. What kind of money am I going to make on this? To others, it's recreation. You know, how do, how do you spend your time in the woods? I mean, there's a, a lot of different directions that you could go, but it all depends on the first thing is, what is the landowner's goal for their property? What do they want off of it? Trees grow like weeds in this part of the world. So whether you want to do it or not, it's gonna happen. You have to look at it like a crop, just like any other crop, whether it's cotton, soybeans, rice, peanuts. The only difference in this commodity and those commodities is the rotation. Right, You're looking at a one-year rotation for row crop and a 30-year rotation to final harvest on trees. You will get a return on your investment within the first 10 to 12 years, depending on what kind of ground you are, because you're going to thin it. Then you're going to wait another 10 years or so, and then you're going to thin it again. Like, this is the fourth time that he's made money off of this ground here. So, even though wood prices aren't exactly what they were years ago, many of the thousands of tree farmers in the country will still make money and will still have something substantial to hand down. It can work and it does work. It not just can, it still does work. I don't know anybody that planted pine trees that lost money. Everybody I've cut their trees for got money for them and made a profit. It might not have been potentially what they thought it would be, but they still did well. You can still buy land and you can still invest and you can still make money. I'm still doing it. I'm still buying land and trees. Uh, you just have to look for the right opportunity. When I buy a car, I don't go out and buy the first one that I see. I don't buy at the first price they quote me at general. So it's all about your negotiation skills and looking and you know, just finding the right fit for you and what your circumstances are. Of course, there's an eco-impact too. Bobby is proud of how his trees stimulate the environment and impact his tree farming strategies amplify. Each tree, in a year produces about 220 pounds of oxygen. After they take the CO2 in, they split it off. We're storing carbon. We're making 220 pounds of oxygen per year. A person uh, breathes about 1,600 pounds of oxygen. So eight trees out here growing produce enough oxygen for you for a year. And lest someone look at the empty land left behind after a final harvest and criticize the lack of trees, Bobby knows that after the next planting and rotation, there will come an even stronger harvest. I'm sure somebody would look at this clear cut and say you shouldn't be destroying trees. 
where we've got an overabundance of trees and I'm taking out older trees that are not gonna live forever. So we're harvesting something that's a renewable uh, resource that's not gonna live forever and replacing it with even better growing vigorous trees. Bottom line, Southerners have planted trees for retirement and in the process created a nest egg that sustained both the here and now and will cradle the generations to come. After all, as the saying goes, money may not grow on trees, but it's a darn good start. Mr. Watkins showed me several checks he earned from the final harvest on his land, but it's clear it's not just about the money. He cares deeply about the land. Well, next week, if it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? We literally get our ducks in a row, or rather one company in Indiana does, the state that became number one in the nation, raising more than half the country's supply. We'll visit the Hoosier State, where farmers are handling challenges like water off a duck's back. And though duck meat is more popular in places like China, these guys are working to make sure the market is all it's quacked up to be. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you miss a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. See you next week. Thanks for watching.